James Bond is the longest running movie franchise in history, with 25 films over nearly 60 years. While consistently commercially successful, even the most die-hard of Bond fans will admit that for every truly amazing film in the series, there are just as many bad ones. General, there's a bomb in that cannon. Sure, where else would a bomb be? <laughs> I mean, just look at the films on Rotten Tomatoes. The best film has 97%. The worst is just 37%. When you compare that to the 23 films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I mean, like Bond, the best of them sits at 97%, but the worst is just 66 So while the MCU has delivered relative consistency from both a commercial and a critical perspective, the Bond films have had a much more hit and miss run with the critics. So ahead of No Time To Die's upcoming release, assuming it doesn't get postponed again, I'm going to try and find out what makes a good James Bond film. To do that, I'm going to focus on the two best movies from the Daniel Craig era. Let's take a look at Casino Royale and Skyfall. It sounds obvious, but James Bond has to be the centre of the movie. Not the action, not the villain's evil plot, not the exotic locations. Bond. James Bond. Casino Royale is a character-driven film that has a clear arc for Bond. It's about him trying to put aside his ego and become the cold-hearted killer M wants him to be, and along the way he meets someone who makes him question where this life will lead. Like you said, you do what I do for too long, and there won't be any soul left to salvage. I'm leaving with what little I have left. In the end, he chooses to follow his heart, only to have that trust betrayed. I mean, take this line. I kill! Allow me. Look at the amount of emotion and character Craig conveys with it. In order to become the Bond we know, he has to see firsthand why he can never open up or remove his armor again. He has to lose everything before he can become... Bond. James Bond. Casino Royale knows that Bond has to be the center of the plot, and the plot needs to be driven by his decisions and actions. We need to see him grow and change over the course of the film. If you need proof of this, take this moment. The main antagonist of the film dies at the end of the second act. The film has another half hour of runtime, focused exclusively on Bond and Vesper. This is not a film about the mission, it's a film about James Bond. Because of that, the film focuses on the consequences of Bond's choices. Throughout the film, he often has to be bailed out by someone else when his ego gets him in too deep. Bond is constantly being challenged throughout Casino Royale, and by the end of it, this Bond is a very different person to this Bond. So James Bond is at the centre, but he cannot exist in a vacuum. Bond is defined by his relationship to two other characters, the female lead and the villain. Let's start with the female lead. By far the thing that has aged the worst from the earlier Bond films is the portrayal of women, and this can make the classics very hard to watch in the 21st century. Uh, man talk. Eva Green's Vesper Lind is the best female character in any Bond film, hands down, except perhaps M, but she has the benefit of featuring in seven films. In just one movie, Vesper is a character as fleshed out and as well formed as Bond, with her own arc and storyline that are just as compelling as James's. Rather than being a passive vessel to simply provide exposition, or simply stand there dressed like this, Vespa is a character with her own agency and journey. Throughout the film, she challenges Bond, stands up to him, but also changes and grows along with him. This scene is one of the most powerful emotional moments in any James Bond film, and it does it all with barely a line of dialogue. It's later followed by this scene. You lost because of your ego, and that same ego can't take it. That's what this is about. It's not often anyone challenges Bond like this, especially a female character. Put it this way, it's a long way from Sean Connery doing this. <laughs> because Bond grows as a character, Vesper too changes her view of him. These two characters are both very different people to these two. And finally, let's not forget that Vesper saved Bond. She made a deal to spare your life in exchange for the money. Her death is what completes Bond's arc, not him completing the mission. I'm glad that Leah Sado's Madeline Swan survived into the next movie, and I hope No Time to Die gives her more room to grow as a character beyond the shell we saw in Spectre, especially after Phoebe Waller-Bridge has been brought on to help polish the script. 
Craig's final outing deserves a female lead as compelling as Vespa Lind, and I still can't believe that a female character written in 2006 is better than one written in 2016. Let's move on to the villain. As countless video essays have shown us, it is very easy for hero-centered franchises to have a villain problem. The Bond films have had their fair share of bad villains, to the point they have become a caricature of themselves, but the villain is part of what defines a good Bond film. Like all good villains, the ones in Casino Royale and Skyfall are compelling because they have clear and understandable motivations that directly challenge Bond's beliefs and actions. They are fleshed out as characters beyond simply being the antagonizing force. Let's use Sylvan Skyfall as our example. Now I admit his plan does follow the trope of deliberately get captured and meticulously plan an elaborate escape, but let's remember that this was still fairly new at the time the film came out. It's one of the reasons it became a trope in the first place. Anyway, this isn't Cinema Sins and I'm not here to pick holes in the plan, although come on Q, IT Security 101, don't connect foreign devices to your hard drive. No, the character is what matters. Like the Joker is to Batman, Silver is the parallel to Bond. Both of them were tools, discarded and betrayed by M when they were no longer useful to MI6. What was it you said? Take the bloody shot. This is the exact point he makes when he first encounters Bond. The two survivors. This is what you made us. I made my own choices. Hmm. You think you did. That's her genius. How each of them responded to this betrayal shows their different characters. Bond knew that M would expect him to have done the same. She would have told him to... to take your ego out of the equation and to judge the situation dispassionately. While angry at first, he realizes this is more because of his ego at not winning rather than M's decision. He chooses to forgive her and comes back to serve his country and rectify his mistake. Silver, meanwhile, chose to dwell on his anger and chose a path of revenge instead of forgiveness. He uses his skills against M and MI6. Now while I usually think revenge is not a very compelling motivation, it works here because Silver's choice shows us the path Bond himself could have taken, but chose not to. And in Skyfall, like Casino Royale, Bond loses. Silver gets his revenge and succeeds in killing M, even if he doesn't live to see it. Bond has to watch again, as one of the few people in his life that he cares about dies in his arms. Like Casino Royale, Skyfall has put Bond at the centre, so the climax is not him defeating the villain, but him losing the person he loves. This is a common feature of all good action films. In the Bond series, the latter films in an actor's tenure often feel like the action is what is driving the story. The filmmakers just wanting to get to the next set piece as quickly as possible. For me, some of the best bits in Skyfall and Casino Royale are the character focused moments that in turn set up the action and make us care about what happens to the characters in those scenes. Let's look at how Skyfall does this. The opening scene shows us how Bond has grown as a double O since the previous movies, as well as M's ongoing commitment to the mission above all else. She is following her own advice and judging the situation dispassionately. It also sets up the plot of the film with the stolen hard drive. The fight in Shanghai shows how Bond has grown weaker. He's facing the consequences of all those Heinekens. We can also see some of his character growth here, compared to the last film where he simply killed every lead he had. It then sets the stage for his meeting with Severine. Pursuing Silver sets up the villain's resourcefulness, motivation, and shows Bond he can't trust anyone. This leads to him and M fleeing to Skyfall Manor, thus setting up the climax of the film, while also giving us insight into Bond's backstory. The point is, these scenes all matter. They develop character and drive the plot forward at the same time. Compare these action scenes to, say, the Burj Khalifa scene in Ghost Protocol. Without a doubt, one of the best action sequences of the decade. I'm not disputing that for a second, but the setup is contrived, and it doesn't advance the plot. It feels like it was reverse engineered. The filmmakers wanted a scene with Tom Cruise climbing the side of the world's tallest building, so came up with some excuses in the screenplay to get him there. Bed ducks. Pressure sensitive. Not enough time. Elevator shaft. Infrared sensors. Not enough time. How am I supposed to do this? This is not a criticism of the scene or its excitement or the stunt work involved. It's one of my favorite standalone action scenes of all time but it doesn't serve a purpose to the plot or character, 
in the same way the action in the Skyfall does. While on the subject of action, we need to feel like they have consequences and impact. Bond needs to get hurt in order for us to feel that he is in danger. Look at his face after the airport fight in Casino Royale. After the stairwell scene, we see Bond taking time to heal, and he stares in the mirror and we can see him questioning himself and his actions. I mean, compare this to the scene in Spectre where he is tortured and then immediately goes and takes out a base full of goons. In Casino Royale and Skyfall, Bond is not invincible. We feel the danger he is in and know that every action has a consequence. Heritage is what separates Bond from any other movie franchise besides Star Wars. To make a great James Bond film, you have to embrace and acknowledge this heritage and show how your film adds to the history of the series without falling back on lazy fan service for the sake of it. Him. One of the things both Casino Royale and Skyfall do superbly well is acknowledge and pay tribute to the heritage of the Bond franchise without it feeling forced for cheap nostalgia points. Him. Classic Bond elements are reintroduced in a seamless way that are fun little easter eggs for longtime fans of the series, without distracting from the plot. Perfect. Things like the reintroduction of the Aston Martin DB5 are neat little touches that work independently in the new continuity of the Craig films, while paying tribute to the 50 years of heritage. When there are more explicit references to earlier Bond tropes, they play on our expectations and subvert them for effect. Walk a martini. Chicken or stir? Do I look like I give a damn? Were you expecting an exploding pen? We don't really go in for that anymore. Meanwhile, scenes like this in Quantum of Solace, this is just distracting and seems out of place with the world of the film. Just for the sake of some fan service, no one asked for. Hey, Quantum of Solace, if you're so desperate to show us you're a James Bond film, how about you have Bond say his most famous line that appears in every single other James Bond film except this one. <sighs> this, this annoys me so much, but my thoughts on Quantum of Solace are another video for another time. Skyfall's production team understood this. In an interview, director Sam Mendes said, There was a definite discussion about Sean Connery playing Kincaid way, way early on, but I think that's problematic. Because to me, it becomes too... It would take you out of the movie. Absolutely the right decision. If Sean Connery walked out into Skyfall Manor, it would immediately undo all of the suspense and tension that the film had been building towards. Remember Matt Damon in Interstellar? It doesn't work. Bringing back an older actor just for the sake of fan service more often than not hinders a film rather than helps it. Ahem. So yes, acknowledge the heritage of the franchise, but make it work independently in the context of your film. So those are my criteria for a good Bond film. Put the character of Bond and how he interacts with the female lead and the villain at the heart of the story, and have the action serve a purpose and have consequences, and pay tribute to the heritage of the franchise without falling into lazy fan service. I mean, obviously other things are important too. Like any good film, the cinematography, editing, special effects, the casting, these are all very important, of course. But if the core building blocks are not there, it will not be a good Bond film. Look at Spectre. It has the highest production values of any Bond film, an A-list cast and an Oscar-winning theme song. But it failed to put Bond at the center by having a parallel storyline with Ralph Fiennes and the MI6 gang, a weak female lead, and wasted not one, but two great actors as the villains, both of whom have objectives that seem more antagonizing to M's character arc than Bond's. The action too felt devoid of purpose or consequence. This is what Bond looked like after a fist fight. This is him after a car crash. Then he does this. And he's just fine? I mean, come on, Spectre. Where I will give Spectre credit is in paying tribute to the heritage, Bond's tuxedo is a really good example of this, but it doesn't get the balance right. The gags with the car gadgets subvert our expectations in a funny way, but coming in the middle of an otherwise serious action scene destroys the tension. Also, don't even get me started on this. The man inside your head is Ernst Stavro Blofeld. 
Looking ahead at No Time to Die, I'm hopeful that they can continue the trend of Craig's odd-numbered films being amazing. Despite the production difficulties, changing director and rewrites, I hope that Phoebe Waller-Bridge coming in to help with the script will compensate for the loss of Danny Boyle as the director. Daniel Craig deserves to finish his 14-year tenure as Bond on a high note. Let's hope they can deliver. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. This was the first video on my channel, so if you want to see me talk more about James Bond and other movies a bit more, then click all the buttons and let me know you liked it. Or if you didn't. See you next time.